Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Golder webinar on digital stakeholder engagement. We are so happy that you're joining us here this morning. Uh, we have close to 183 people enrolled for this webinar, which just shows the huge level of interest in this topic uh, from all over Canada, coast to coast, and also in the United States. So it's, it's great to see that there's such, uh, such a deep interest in this topic. Which, which probably isn't that surprising, given all the restrictions that we've experienced uh, in the last uh, few months on our ability to have face-to-face -face communication uh, and meaningful, uh, meaningful two-way communication with our, with our family, with our stakeholders, with our business partners. So certainly the challenges that COVID has created in our lives are, are probably here for the foreseeable future. These, you know, these technologies may help us adapt to that situation. My name is Kevin Steele. I'm a senior environmental consultant with Golder in our Calgary office in Alberta, Canada, and I'll be your host and your moderator today. Before I introduce our presenter, Dr. Massimo Dragon, I'll do some brief housekeeping and we'll have a health and safety moment. Let's just go to my other screen. So your microphone has been automatically muted. Uh, and we hope that you do ask questions through the course of the presentation. To do that, if you go to the lower right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a questions bar. You can type in the question. As the moderator, I will receive them and I will compile them at the end of the, uh, the presentation and we'll have a, a Q&A session. So please, uh, please stick around for that. That should be quite interesting. Um, we'll also be conducting three polling questions. So we'll be asking for your feedback uh, and you'll see when the screen comes up, there are options to, to click on voting. Uh, and we'll collect some information and share that with the group, which should also be really interesting to add to the discussion. This webinar will be recorded and will be made available uh, upon request. A brief health and safety moment. I mentioned COVID, hand sanitizer. This is, uh, this is a, a something that's become part of all of our lives over the last uh, few months. Uh, but what you may not be familiar with is that it is uh, primarily alcohol. Most hand sanitizer are, are, are alcohol-based, which are hydrocarbons. And as such, they are, are highly flammable substances. So they should be stored in a cool location, certainly away from sources of, of heat or any kind of ignition. And we've had reports uh, through our clients recently where hand sanitizer has been left in locations such as vehicles, which of course get very hot now that we're moving into the summer months and they've actually ignited so the uh, vehicles have caught fire which is obviously a very serious situation uh, the other thing you need to be aware of is uh, as you apply it to your hands you want to make sure that it's completely evaporated before you touch anything like an electrical switch or an outlet or a plug or any kind of equipment if you cause a spark the hand sanitizer can ignite and it burns with a colorless flame but nonetheless uh, people have been getting again severely uh, burned so these are things you want to be aware of as we continue to uh, have COVID uh, type challenges in our lives. So without further delay, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, my good friend and colleague from Golder's office in uh, Turin, Italy this, uh, this evening for Massimo. Uh, Massimo is a principal and is project director at Golder. Uh, he also leads our European information management team and is responsible for leading Golder's media lab initiative which has the goal of promoting and exploring visual communication in the realm of earth and social sciences, as well as data communication. So I've had the, the pleasure of working with Massimo and his team for several years now. And what you'll see presented today is the result of, of many projects and many ongoing conversations, sometimes arguments and, and productive discussions and uh, learnings and experiences uh, in this realm. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Massimo. Thank you very much, Kevin, and uh, good day, everybody. It's a pleasure and an honor to uh, have you participate uh, in this webinar in the interest of uh, the presentation, give uh, full real estate. I'll turn off uh, my camera during the, the presentation. So again, thanks for uh, joining us. So the topic of today is uh, digital uh, stakeholder engagement, and we thought we would take uh, the opportunity to give you um, a broad spectrum of uh, experiences, uh, projects, uh, lessons learned uh, during uh, over a decade now in leveraging the opportunities that uh, digital technologies uh, give us to augment uh, the capabilities that we have and make uh, stakeholder engagement activities uh, uh, more uh, fruitful and effective. 
So to start uh, from a common ground, uh, let's uh, simplify uh, the typical process of stakeholder engagement uh, in three broad uh, steps or in three broad activities. So initially, uh, the, the key objective of stakeholder engagement is to meet with the stakeholders, obviously. And the primary reason is uh, to uh, give them the legitimate uh, uh, ability to understand where they can find information and how they can be in contact with what is happening uh, during the project uh, uh, lifetime. The second uh, step usually uh, requires then that you explain uh, the project or the activity uh, that requires stakeholder engagement. And so you need to uh, factor in uh, the uh, typical challenges that you have in communication, uh, potential uh, cultural diversity, um, as well as uh, uh, you know, trying to be effective uh, in explaining uh, the key aspects uh, of, uh, of a project. The third uh, area of stakeholder engagement uh, is the involvement itself. So is the uh, tension towards uh, gathering information from stakeholders and uh, help them um, address their concerns, uh, uh, response to, and to questions like uh, how can they contribute, how can they voice uh, their opinion. And so we have the um, interest uh, and, the, and the task of collecting that uh, information and relaying it back uh, to the project uh, so that uh, uh, those voices can be uh, taken into consideration. If we do an analogy in the digital world, um, then this uh, uh, spectrum becomes uh, more interesting and we and digital approaches offer new opportunities. Uh, so if we make that analogies of meet, explain and involve, a meeting essentially means uh, using channels that uh, digital technologies uh, make available to us. And it gives us a broad spectrum of ways that we can use to meet our, tar our targets or the, the stakeholder communities. Uh, in the explain uh, component, uh, here we're talking about languages. So digital provides us uh, uh, innumerable uh, uh, tools uh, and innumerable ways uh, of uh, communicating in a clear, simple and effective way the key aspects uh, of a project. The third uh, element is uh, receiving uh, the feedback from stakeholders. And here as well, uh, a digital approach uh, uh, will provide us uh, additional uh, tools uh, and additional techniques to uh, incorporate, understand, analyze uh, what is the, the point of view of the different stakeholders uh, that they have uh, expressed during uh, the life cycle of a project. So before we uh, start to look at uh, examples uh, and um, kind of uh, dig deeper into each of these three areas that will be kind of the, uh, the way that we've structured the presentation today, uh, we'd like to um, break the ice with you and uh, uh, engage you. Uh, so we're going to uh, have uh, three polls during this, uh, the course of this presentation. And um, I'm going to kindly ask that we start with the first question so that uh, you also uh, have the ability to get familiar with uh, how the polling will work. So we're going to have a very first uh, uh, question that is going to be very simple. And the question is, have you used uh, uh, digital tools uh, in your previous stakeholder engagement projects? Uh, so kindly select one of the two uh, options here and then click Submit. And then we're going to give you uh, time for voting. Um, so the votes are, I see that are coming in. We'll give you a few more uh, seconds to provide your feedback. Okay, and here is the, the answer. Okay, so we're close to a 50-50 uh, split with uh, uh, still a, a slight majority. Uh, towards uh, not having uh, had the opportunity to use digital tools. So maybe today um, we're going to uh, give you a few uh, insights or additional uh, ideas about you know, how and when these, uh, uh, these digital tools may be applicable. So we can close this and move forward. Thank you. So let's uh, uh, start to explore these three stages uh, uh, with more, uh, a bit more in detail. And we're gonna use uh, primarily project examples, as I mentioned, to illustrate some of the components uh, of each of these. So let's begin with, uh, with channels. Uh, and we're gonna use in each of these steps, uh, this uh, kind of mind map that will give us the ability to explore two components. It will give us the sense 
of the richness of uh, approaches, um, tools, uh, or in this case, uh, channels that we have available uh, to uh, address uh, stakeholders. So it also kind of gives you uh, the idea that uh, there is there is a complex uh, it's it's a complex uh, process, and we're going to uh, discuss this uh, as well. So here to make this uh, story a bit more simple, we've used the two main axes uh, to describe when and where these channels would be most most applicable. So we can uh, look at uh, um, ways to engage with stakeholders uh, in events that are scheduled or in a more of a real-time type of uh, um, engagement. And we can also have uh, activities that are more location-based uh, versus activities that uh, can be done uh, just using uh, digital, a digital approach uh, tools so that uh, uh, even from remote, a stakeholder would be still able to be uh, informed uh, and participate in, in the process. For each of these moments, we can also kind of characterize uh, the key aspects of these, uh, uh, of these channels. Uh, so why don't we start with a common format to engage, which is uh, uh, an open house event. Um, so in this case, uh, it's scheduled. You, you typically plan this ahead of time. Uh, you prepare all your materials, so you're going to bring with you uh, an array of different media to illustrate the project. Um, and then there's also different ways to gather uh, the feedback. As Kevin mentioned earlier, um, this is probably the, the activity that has become the most complex uh, to organize with, uh, uh, with the stakeholders. Uh, so albeit it might be very effective and have uh, the idea that you're, you know, you're physically in the same place, you're able to uh, talk and interact, which is something that we're, uh, as humans, we're obviously uh, becomes a, uh, as a natural way of communicating, of exchanging information. Uh, today, this is, um, is really, um, essentially, the, the, the current situation is the, is the biggest hurdle to uh, using this type of uh, technique in uh, stakeholder engagement. Uh, obviously, projects uh, still need to uh, move forward. So if we look at, uh, on the other spectrum, uh, the digital counterpart, if you wish, to uh, an open house uh, event where you uh, bring in this comprehensive view of the project and all of its, uh, in all of its aspects, as well as you, uh, you gather the feedback from the stakeholders as they participate in this event. Uh, we believe that uh, a web portal could could serve very well this uh, uh, this type of role. And I'm gonna switch to this example. So the idea here is that uh, um, using a portal, so a location that is available online where you communicate uh, effectively the characteristics uh, of the project, so where you have the ability to leverage information uh, from a geographic standpoint of where the project uh, uh, key assets will be uh, will be happening, will be constructed, or whatever type of activity we have. And you can invite the user to explore uh, these uh, key elements of the, uh, of the project. Uh, you can also, using you know, uh, common, commonly used uh, geographic information systems, uh, add additional layer of information that would be likely familiar with the, uh, with the stakeholders that are involved. So you give them that uh, relationship component of where will things happen and how will they interact with maybe key aspects uh, uh, of the community that they would be familiar with. Another uh, important uh, component of every, uh, of every project uh, is uh, the evolution of time of activities. So here also you have the opportunity to use a, a visual language approach to clearly and simply uh, explain uh, what will be the sequencing of these activities uh, so that um, uh, a user that uh, ac has access to the to the portal would have a clear understanding of when things will happen, and uh, you would be able to invite them to uh, uh, also, you know, provide uh, provide your feedback. On feedback, uh, um, a common uh, mechanism to gather feedback uh, in in face to face meeting or in other type of surveys is is uh, uh, inviting stakeholders to compile uh, surveys, and you know, clearly you can create the digital version of that uh, mechanism to uh, collect uh, users' feedback. Another uh, type of uh, um, example 
in of uh, providing uh, information about the project and if you wish another interesting channel that we're, we've uh, um, explored uh, uh, in, in a lot of the detail is the use of interactive uh, kiosks. Uh, this project um, uh, started about three years ago uh, due to an oil spill uh, uh, incident. And um, our approach to developing a strategy for involving stakeholders was to actually bring the information in the communities. So rather than, so having, if you wish, a, a, a very localized approach, but still leveraging uh, digital uh, tools and a digital language to explain uh, the reasons for that incident and what our client had done to mitigate the, the negative effects. So uh, these are the locations uh, where uh, we deployed 10 of these uh, large screen uh, monitors uh, uh, that display information that tell the story of the incident that happened. But then as uh, uh, time went by, uh, the idea of creating a kiosk uh, with information essentially became a point of contact and the presence of the client in the community. Um, so a way to reinforce the activities that the client was uh, was doing. And a lot of them are actually involving uh, the sustainable development of the regions, the contribution that the company has in promoting alternative energy resources as in, the, as in this case. So the role of the kiosks um, changed and evolved from initially explaining an incident to then um, maintaining that, that local presence uh, and emphasizing the role that they had in the community. There was also, there is also an environmental component. So uh, part of the activities that the client uh, routinely executes is uh, environmental monitoring. So uh, this gave us the opportunity to uh, make available online and in real time data that was coming from in this case air quality monitoring with the, the same with water with water quality so this became really a point uh, of information in the community uh, we deployed this in uh, uh, town halls and in uh, in public malls um, so they would be available when people uh, provide you with that uh, uh, interest and are able to spend time. We also monitor the use uh, of the uh, of the kiosks, so we are able to collect information about uh, which are the elements of this story that we're bringing uh, in the community that uh, attract more interest in the community, so that we can maintain the dialogue that was started <clears throat> during an unfortunate uh, uh, incident uh, event, but that then continued uh, once that. Uh, relationship, uh, uh, that closer relationship was uh, established uh, in the community. If we move to, uh, if we move forward to the second uh, element, let's talk about uh, languages. So let's talk about uh, what are the different techniques uh, that digital, uh, a digital approach uh, uh, offers to us to convey that message to tell that story. Um, so let's remain in the, uh, in the realm of this project uh, uh, that I just mentioned of the community kiosk. So uh, 3D representation uh, is probably uh, you know, the most effective way uh, and the closest experience to uh, really giving that representation of what uh, happens in, uh, in, in reality. The role that uh, a three-dimensional representation has in this case uh, is to actually physically break that barrier of the people uh, for uh, typically for safety reason uh, experience in not being able to access the facility where the incident actually happened. So we thought that uh, um, displaying in a three-dimensional and simplified view an industrial facility and providing um, a, a mechanism for them to explore uh, that facility and uh, you know the, the key elements of that facility, so that they would understand uh, you know what that facility is actually involved in. It provides you know it's an important asset in the community. There's uh, you know thousands of workers that uh, uh, work here, but w we knew that there was a gap in understanding you know uh, what and what this type, what this particular type of industrial facility uh, was actually. Uh, how it was actually operating. If we uh, use a different, uh, switching gears to a different uh, 
um, related uh, example, uh, just to give you a feel for uh, the different uh, languages that you can uh, use and the different approaches that you can use in, in a three-dimensional representation. So we saw a fairly technical uh, and detailed, uh, uh, you know, sort of an engineering style, if you wish, of communication. Um, we've, that's not the only way that you can uh, tell a story of how things uh, work. So uh, a few years ago, um, Golder uh, did um, a project on communicating uh, what was what was the all sense uh, about and uh, what type of activities and what was their evolution over time. Uh, so in this case, we felt that uh, a more colloquial and a, a more, if you wish, cartoonish way of explaining uh, you know the evolution over time of a project, as well as uh, you know all of the phases uh, that the project uh, would entail, and so provide a, uh, an explanation of each phase for a user that had a bit more time or that expressed more interest in better understanding. Besides, you know, a pictorial representation, you know, what uh, uh, what each each phase was. Uh, uh, was actually entailing and, and have uh, additional information. So uh, the idea that uh, a three-dimensional and a digital representation also gives you this ability to create multiple layers of information uh, so that uh, the user uh, decides how much time they have available and the more interest they express, the more content you're able to feed them uh, so that you know, you know it's uh, the, the more engagement uh, is available, the more information is uh, uh, is accessible, if you wish. Another classic uh, uh, mechanism to visually represent um, information and convey information is rep is uh, infographics. Infographics have been around for uh, many many years, and uh, uh, the uh, the digital expression of uh, infographics is that uh, they offer you this ability to interact with, uh, with them. In this case, uh, um, we've used it to explain an environmental and social monitoring project. Um, so I think it's also important in a in number of cases uh, to convey visually the message of what the activities will be about. So even a description of an, or of an activity that in this case had a a multi-year evolution that was uh, extremely intensive. In this case, this was uh, the largest environmental monitoring program uh, in the country. And uh, the company actually wanted to um, reveal the amount of effort that they were uh, embarking on to make sure that both the environmental as well as the social uh, side of the project were, uh, were taken into consideration that there was uh, stewardship by the company while they were uh, pursuing the um, construction of uh, of the bridge that was the objective of this uh, uh, in this case it was the, the the topic of this of this project and again here um, visually representing information allows you to mix those components of what we're going to do where we're going to do it and how long it's going to take in this case there was also a lot of emphasis in what would be uh, the tools that would be made available to different uh, categories of stakeholders. So in this case, you see the, a typical exercise that you will be familiar with, so stakeholder mapping. And then we, uh, so we designed different uh, ways and different channels to uh, provide information for different uh, reasons to different groups of stakeholders. Uh, so again, the, the the key purpose here is to you know, kind of uh, uh, illustrate what would be the environmental monitoring plan, what would be the opportunities for stakeholders to be, uh, to maintain uh, that connection to the project, to stay informed, to have the ability to uh, verify the progress of this project. The last example that I would like to, um, uh, to use here for uh, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the different languages that we can use is uh, becoming increasingly, I think it's becoming increasingly uh, interesting and uh, and common, and it's uh, the use of uh, uh, virtual or augmented reality. Uh, so virtual reality is, uh, has been around now for uh, for a few years. Uh, it started as many things uh, digital in the uh, more in the entertainment uh, 
uh, environment. But we have, uh, in the last at least five years, we've uh, seen a, a, a tremendous uptake and a lot of, uh, we've had a lot of uh, opportunities and projects to uh, kind of demonstrate, if you wish, uh, the value of uh, an experience that is the closest to actually uh, physically being on a, on a site and seeing things as if you were there. Uh, I'll quickly show you a, uh, a video of uh, an in-person experience uh, using a virtual reality headset. So you'll see the, uh, the point of view that uh, in the video that will move, this is essentially the user that just turns his, his or her head. So you use a, uh, a virtual reality headset uh, to look at things and it's the most natural experience that you could have. You just look around as we typically do when we are uh, in, a, in, a, in an environment. Uh, in this case, uh, we added also interactivity. So the pointer that you see there is the user that has the ability to, to draw in that environment. We have created this as a multi-user experience so you can have a conversation where you virtually uh, uh, teleport multiple people in this uh, location uh, in the north uh, in the north of europe uh, and in this case they were reviewing uh, the plan for a new uh, wind power uh, project uh, and uh, in this case uh, the, the key purpose here was to uh, look at a potential uh, visual impact on a hamlet that is used during the summer uh, in this specific area. So we even, we added uh, uh, elements that you would typically see on a, you know, on a technical report or that you would see uh, in spreadsheet tables or on, a, or on a flat map. We actually gave the opportunity to both the technical team, but as well as you know, potentially the people that own this place to actually see for themselves where the towers would be, uh, what would be our uh, you know, the, the result of our analysis and now we were able to mitigate uh, uh, the potential negative uh, effects uh, uh, in, in this case. So switching gears to a third, uh, um, the, our third uh, stage of stakeholder engagement, uh, um, potentially and probably the, the one that uh, uh, is uh, the most important and, and the one that uh, requires a lot of uh, a lot of care is uh, the component of uh, involvement in this case uh, our representation is uh, on this mind map is from uh, information so gathering information is more quantitative versus a more qualitative approach and then uh, the different uh, techniques uh, can also be uh, you know more on the informative side so where uh, you uh, deliver information to the stakeholders versus uh, creating that uh, collaborative uh, environment so you where you use digital tools to actually invite uh, that feedback and collect those uh, pieces of information that would um, give you the ability to really understand um, you know the different points of view of the stakeholders I think the um, one of the the most interesting opportunities uh, uh, in this enhanced collaboration and the ability to provide a, a rich feedback um, is really this idea that uh, you can collect um, using a digital approach uh, quantitative uh, information about the, the type of feedback and the type of uh, um, relationship that the stakeholders uh, are interested in having in the, uh, during the process of stakeholder engagement. Uh, so the idea that uh, uh, just by using these tools uh, a user is indirectly giving you the insights on what uh, their picks their interest or you know what could be uh, a topic that uh, uh, people uh, gravitate around and so um, the idea that uh, you're able to also uh, validate the effectiveness of those channels that you have opened you know if if we have uh, multiple avenues to reach our stakeholders, we obviously need to understand in terms of their, their effectiveness um, in establishing that uh, uh, discourse, that, uh, that channel, that communication with them. Um, another uh, interesting, uh, I think an increasingly interesting uh, platform uh, in this respect is represented uh, uh, by mobile apps. Um, we probably, nobody, uh, you know, uh, knew what impact would have had uh, the uh, 
the age uh, of uh, smartphones in our lives and we now consider them essentially as part of you know, uh, a natural extension of, uh, of our uh, capabilities. So in this respect, uh, uh, it is probably the tool that we have at hand uh, that opens that door to um, giving you the ability to establish this collaborative uh, discourse and engagement with uh, with stakeholders, uh, maintaining this uh, red uh, line with the project uh, of the oil spill. This is uh, these are a few examples and screenshots on um, the design of a mobile application that we um, that we have uh, uh, made available, uh, so that uh, people would be able to bring that information from the kiosk uh, in the in the palm of their of their hands. And so that would uh, give you the ability to provide that information and the user would be uh, you know, choosing by themselves when they have the time to review this information. Uh, it also uh, creates a more colloquial uh, type of relationship that you have with, the, with stakeholders. Now you have the ability to inform them when there's new information available and, and it would be there and they would be have obviously the freedom to decide if they want to explore this new information or not. Uh, you could even uh, take this uh, further um, further down that road of collaboration and provide them with the ability to send you visual feedback. So you know, a smartphone is is uh, probably the, the one of the reasons. I'm uh, not sure if if you know, but one of the reasons why the, the primary reasons why people change the phone is because of the camera, uh, because they want a new and different camera. So uh, you know, uh, we are in a in a visual we're a visual uh, uh, species, highly visual species, and so seeing things is a, a, a way to uh, understand, communicate. So, you know, take a picture and send me that piece of information so that I can understand if you have noticed something uh, in the area can be an opportunity that a mobile app would be uh, would be opening. At this stage, we have uh, uh, completed. Uh, this journey in these three steps uh, of uh, the uh, of the stakeholder engagement process. So uh, before we move to uh, the final uh, considerations of our of uh, the presentation, and then open the floor to uh, any question or um, uh, or you know, curiosity or or additional information that you'd like to uh, to discuss today. Um, why don't we take a, a moment and, and ask you uh, the second uh, question of our poll uh, for today. Um, and so we're going to give a bit more granularity uh, to the initial question. And so we'd like to understand if uh, you've used uh, any of the listed uh, uh, engagement uh, solutions uh, that are listed here. You can pick more than one if you've used uh, more than one uh, technique. And as we did before, we're going to uh, give you time to uh, make your choices. So we'll give it a few more seconds. We're almost where we were initially. Okay, so more votes come in. I think we're, we're good now. So let's reveal. Okay, so social media, you know, are are inevitably um, have inevitably become a very common way to establish that relationship. Let me while we're here, let me point that uh, uh, I think the quantitative approach uh, is also an opportunity that digital uh, gives you, and social network are one of the uh, arenas where uh, applying quantitative analysis to uh, that type of feedback, especially in informal. Um, channels like social networks are, uh, you know, there's a increasing, uh, increasingly common um, practices of analyzing, uh, you know, in a more scientific way uh, that content as and also, you know, trying to gather those insights uh, as well as uh, un try to understand what is the also the emotional side of uh, uh, of the feedback that you're that you're receiving. Websites are. Uh, you know, the most uh, common um, mechanism here. I think the uh, one interesting uh, evolution that we see on a website is uh, the ability to create really 
uh, a lot of interaction, the use of uh, 3D versus uh, you know just um, what they call the, the the wall of words. Um, so you know, give it a, a very engaging uh, uh, not only look and feel but also uh, features so that people can can really navigate through uh, through the content. Okay, I think we can close uh, the poll. Thank you. And uh, so let's now um, move towards uh, the final uh, the final uh, considerations uh, uh, of this presentation today. So uh, I think the, the, the real question uh, for us, and we would like to you know the purpose today is really to share uh, a lot of uh, uh, discussions and uh, and um, um, considerations that we've made uh, in in the past. Uh, uh, and we, that we continue to, to ask ourselves is how do you uh, navigate this complexity? How do you uh, effectively um, make good use of all these channels of, of these different uh, uh, techniques that you have to convey the message and to receive uh, the feedback? Um, I think Golder understood the role that digital uh, would play you know, well in advance and, and 10 years ago, um, we established a, a specialized business unit that's called the Golder uh, Media Lab that really sits across, uh, you know, this, the topics that we talked about uh, today. And uh, we have specialized in uh, this idea of, uh, you know, creating multi-channel and cross-media digital strategies. And I hope that, uh, you know, with uh, the spectrum of examples that we gave you today, you've seen, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, the journey that uh, we ourselves have, uh, you know, have uh, traveled, uh, you know, with with a number of you in partnership uh, and in uh, interesting projects uh, around the world. Uh, so I, th I think we have. Uh, um, there's two things. One, we've uh, understood and and uh, took note of things that work and things that don't, uh, and that's very important because uh, you need to learn from, um, you know. From understanding how a different uh, a different approach uh, uh, plays out uh, during the life cycle of a project, a lot of effort that we put was also into trying to uh, find out what would be the ideal workflow uh, to apply a digital approach to stakeholder engagement. And this is what uh, here's how we depict it. So the idea is that um, uh, we always approach projects. Uh, um, initially from a strategic uh, standpoint. So uh, we collaboratively with our, um, with our clients uh, look at uh, uh, all of the aspects of the project uh, and extract the key features of those projects to create this initial uh, storyboard um, where you have looked at um, you know, what the project will look like, uh, uh, what will be the stakeholders that uh, uh, will be involved during this process. So typically this happens uh, uh, you know, in parallel or during the the stakeholder mapping um, phase of a project, and then once you have that uh, you know overall game plan, then uh, you look at uh, what would be the most effective and appropriate languages uh, that would need that would serve the purpose of uh, uh, executing on that uh, on that strategy. So here is where uh, you would decide what role each of the the, the media that uh, we uh, we touched on today um, would have the uh, this uh, uh, sequence also allows you to develop uh, essentially a common set of assets uh, that then uh, would serve the purpose of feeding the different channels and they could be a combination of digital ones as well as traditional so you know uh, a leaflet that has a timeline and an infographics uh, and an infographic that you've developed uh, in the strategic initial uh, stage um, may be the most appropriate uh, uh, mechanism that you're going to use to uh, engage with the, uh, with your stakeholders. But at the same time, uh, if you create these assets from the beginning, then you then one a, a different uh, outlet could also be uh, the digital expression of that uh, timeline and uh, uh, an infographic. Uh, some of the the lessons that we learned and some of the key benefits that we want to highlight of how this uh, sequencing, um, I think, benefits uh, the, the project uh, success, the process of stakeholder engagement, uh, um, are that uh, an integrated uh, strategy uh, you know, gives you this 
uh, overall uh, broad idea of how you're going to um, move forward uh, in all aspects uh, of the stakeholder engagement process. It also allows you to manage change that is inevitable in every project uh, in, a more, um, uh, in a more coordinated way. Uh, the other idea and concept is that uh, having uh, assets that have, have been developed uh, in, a coherent, in a coherent way will give you, you know, this visual representation that you can then reuse uh, in, different, uh, uh, in different outlets. And necessarily this brings uh, you know, that component of uh, optimization of costs um, that is uh, obviously important for, for any uh, project uh, activity. And finally, uh, I think the application of uh, these techniques uh, uh, really has uh, this benefit of giving you the ability to measure your results, to uh, quantify what works and what doesn't, you know, uh, how much interest you're receiving, how much time are stakeholders providing you, how uh, confident are they in using the tools and channels that you make, uh, that you make available. And with this, uh, you know, overall objective to make the outreach to, this, to uh, the stakeholders uh, as comprehensive uh, as possible. Okay, so before we uh, move to the question and answers uh, side, so this is the uh, the final uh, the final stage of the of uh, our presentation today. And so before we open the the floor to questions, uh, I'd like to bring in. Uh, the final uh, question, so the final poll, and uh, we'd like to now give you maybe a future look. So, uh, you know, hopefully we have uh, um, we have created a bit of uh, interest in some of in some possibilities uh, that you may have not considered uh, before. So, uh, the question is a future look uh, of you know, which of which of the same stakeholder engagement solutions that we listed before uh, you'd be interested in considering. Uh, and, to use uh, in the future. And so please, for the last time, uh, would be interesting to hear uh, your voice and quantitatively collect the feedback. So leverage digital tools. Uh, that's been one of the underlying uh, currents here of, uh, of uh, leveraging these tools. To, so you know, the, we, we can't uh, unfortunately meet at the moment, but at the same time, we're you know, we are effectively finding uh, uh, creative ways to, uh, you know, to to still have this conversation. And I believe all the votes are in, so let's see the results. Okay, so numbers have changed. Um, so kiosks uh, have become are interesting. So um, it's interesting to see the reaction uh, it's uh, the other comment that i would make is uh, is um, there's interest in multiple channels and i think this is uh, a realization that we've had uh, in these years uh, it's unlikely that uh, you're going to have just a single avenue that will cover uh, everything and uh, we are we all live and we are all immersed in a uh, in digital, uh, uh, you know, in, in in a digital uh, life, in some sense, and one key characteristic of that is that there's multiple ways to accomplish things, and there's there's multiple uh, moments in uh, in the day when you're going to have uh, uh, time to make available for something that is of interest, and I think this is probably the reflection that I would make in looking at uh, at your responses here. So thanks for uh, we can close this and then. I think we're going to I'm gonna, uh, open the floor now for uh, hopefully uh, a few questions that uh, our, um, our uh, contribution today has, uh, has maybe sparked. So Yeah, we're back into on. the Q&A session there. I'm just looking at those photos though. Those are, those are clearly uh, pre-COVID <laughs> Golder yearbook photos. <laughs> oh, how to look like that again. Uh, super interesting presentation, Massimo. Thanks for going through that. It seems like, you know, just based on some of your examples, that there's um, perhaps a longer history of use of some of these tools in, in the European context, just given the, the complexity of so many people in, in a relatively compact, compact space. Is that is that fair to say from your observations? I would say so. And um, the, you know, it's uh, also distances and remoteness maybe here is less... Uh, 
uh, is less uh, of a challenge, uh, albeit, uh, you know, I would say the kiosk example that I gave you was uh, in an area where one of the strategic decisions to bring the kiosks there was also to, you know, kind of bridge uh, potentially a digital gap that uh, we recognize that, uh, that was there. Um, but I think, uh, you know, in general, Europe uh, has, has certainly uh, provided a, a, you know, a great uh, laboratory ground, if you wish. And, um, you know, the, this idea that uh, we really, you know, had a, a decade long to uh, you know, really try out and experiment, uh, um, you know, leave away things that uh, really didn't, uh, didn't carry the message, I think, was, uh, uh, you know, was an interesting ride, for sure. Yeah, and it, you know, it's when we think of the Canadian context, uh, we have a lot of uh, very remote, uh, very inaccessible communities. What are what are your thoughts around, um, you know, applying this type of a technology or approach to, to communities that may be remote? And, and in Canada, that that comes with uh, potentially, you know, communities that may not have the best in, internet, or perhaps, you know, if we look at examples in the Canadian North where internet uh, access may be interrupted or offline for a period of time what, what sorts of strategies would you use or suggest for um, you know helping these types of technologies being deployed in remote communities in the north and so forth in the Canadian context yeah so the idea of having uh, of having kiosks uh, was uh, so the by design they've been uh, um, they've been thought out uh, as being uh, assets that wouldn't necessarily require a connection. So that they would be, you know, in the community, and that you wouldn't need to have them uh, uh, necessarily all time, all the time uh, online. We also um, used uh, and, and deployed um, uh, kiosks uh, that would require just a minimum uh, amount of information, so that uh, you, you know you would package them, and then uh, the update would just require just a simple phone uh, phone connection. Uh, so there's there's different ways, but the of uh, accommodating low bandwidth uh, situation. But the, the the key idea here is that uh, that story is is there in the community, and uh, you need to prepare yourself for you know uh, maybe doing updates that are, that not necessarily require you know high bandwidth or or always on uh, or always on uh, connectivity. Great, thanks. So we're getting a lot of questions here from the floor. Uh, let me just go to uh, one here. So uh, is it reasonable for a regulator to request a proponent to create one of these digital tools? And then the, the follow-up to that is, if so, which tool would you recommend that is the most cost-effective and timely to develop? So I'll maybe turn this question is, uh, I, th I think that one of the realizations that we have is that, or that we need to have maybe, is that uh, there's almost an expectation uh, that information will be digitally available. We, I think the real risk that we run here is that we underestimate the, the thirst, if you wish, for information that people have. And so probably, you know, uh, I think you know, mobile apps are, are certainly, um, very effective, very simple to create. Uh, typically, the the cycle to generate, uh, you know, a, a web application is very uh, is very short. Uh, also, consider that uh, developing on the web in general uh, allows you that ability to create it once and then deploy it in on multiple channels. So, a, a website created the, the technical term is uh, in a responsive way would be you, you could access it from your computer as well as from the, the mobile phone and uh, the, con the same content so this idea of the initial assets and this is what we have the web the kiosk the website and the web application and the the content that is displayed as is developed once so it it can be cost effective doesn't mean that you need to select only one of these channels it can be uh, you know the developed once and deployed on multiple channels but definitely you know uh, web portals and and apps are probably uh you know the, the most uh the, the obvious start because it's what people typically use the most excellent thank you uh, another question from the floor uh thank you for an interesting presentation massimo what would you recommend what would your recommendations be for engaging digitally with stakeholders some of who may have intermittent uh availability and access to modern technology i.e older computers thank you i think we've answered that 
Um, oh, here we are. This is the question. Uh, so using um, a platform for the management of Indigenous consultation records, in other words, a chronological repository for records of contacting, meeting minutes, phone emails, et cetera, so state tracker type uh, of solution. Um, uh, how would that align to, first off, the software and the solutions that are available out there, and then uh, all, also the uh, the Aboriginal consultations offices reporting templates and requirements? What are your thoughts there in terms of the formal uh, process of managing the uh, the engagement? So I, I believe that um, uh, there's two aspects here, and one is uh, the tools that you're going to use to track information, where you're going to have this you know record of all the activities that you've uh, uh, carried out and so the concept of using uh, you know a, a database approach so a repository that uh, where every action and every activity has been uh, archived uh, and recorded is is necessarily very important uh, if if I was to strategically leverage that uh, repository then I would I would go for probably you know a tools and platform that would allow me to bring information from that repository and maybe provide that provide a more visual uh, visual and simplified view to the communities to uh, you know, explain that effort. So it's obviously difficult to explain how many phone calls you've had and likes. So you need to record how many phone calls you've taken. You need to record how many questions you've, you've uh, received. But it's also important to communicate uh, effectively and to people that would be just interested to uh, have the proof that you've you know, carried out all the activities as you should have. So I think you know visualizing uh, the outcome of all those activities is uh, uh, is equally important. We're actually currently in um, in the process of, of uh, in, in that project that uh, that I explained. We're actually creating one infographic to explain what the remediation project is, and we're talking to absolutely non-technical people. So we have our databases where all the environmental information has been recorded and 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 is well kept and maintained. So you have your technical tools, but then I think this additional layer where you extract uh, the meaning, the results, the, even communicate the effort that you've uh, that made or the diligence that, that you've had is, uh, again, is, is uh, equally important. I, I think we don't, uh, we, there, there's, we, we don't need to be shy to explain how much, we, how much effort we put into doing things right. This is probably the key message. And, you know, Show, showing how much you've done is is a great way. You know? uh, part of that uh, infographic on the environmental monitoring program was to explain that we were about to collect information from all over the place for years, and and that message is typically buried into you know a 400 pages uh, environmental monitoring uh, technical plan that uh, only only specialists would be uh, would be using. Uh, you know, just, uh, and I'm not an expert uh, on this, but, you know, just thinking of my involvement with your and your team, I mean, the, these these tools seem very customizable to me. So if there are other applications that uh, that companies are, are are comfortable with using for recording their engagement uh, activities or perhaps uh, solutions they've developed internally, that there's, there's a degree of customization and interactivity that can be built into these solutions, correct? Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, the... The point is that uh, so today when you develop these things so you don't create silos that's the key and uh, you need to create uh, you know every modern solution that uses digital uh, by design assumes that it will be fed by information that comes from other sources okay so the concept of uh, a monolith application is, is you know tells that you're in trouble if you're headed in that direction because <laughs> you know it will hit you at some point I think we've been there. Um, you know, just building on your 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 thoughts of the infographic, we've got a really interesting question around uh, multilingual uh, stakeholder groups and perhaps uh, groups where literacy is a challenge. So, what are your thoughts there in terms of how to portray information to uh, non-technical audiences, multiple languages, uh, literacy challenges? So, I think we've we've been there actually in a, in a project that we did in in Canada with First Nations, where we wanted to explain the different. Uh, um, the, the thought process behind uh, choosing a dif different um, remediation techniques on a contaminated site. And uh, so the technique that we used was uh, twofold. One um, was to uh, visualize what that was those options would be uh, in the most realistic way, uh, where we added the realistic content to existing pictures of that site 
and because the the concept of let me show you i think is the most powerful possible that's why you know uh, things like uh, uh virtual reality that, that may still look like uh, something uh, a little uh, that you need to adapt to uh once you try it it's so natural that uh that it's that's what i, I think st strikes me and, and it's impressive in how natural that is um in, in that specific project we also um, you know, uh, show the, the, the thought process in in a, in a very simple you know it's a three steps process this this is what it, it entails and so the the use of visual uh, content versus uh, text because text is is more difficult to um, to process to translate in multiple languages it may have different uh, uh, different uh, meanings or or interpretation so I think a good a good use a good use of uh, of visuals and the use of analogies. So if you know, uh, you know, I we make analogies all the time, right? So if I need to tell you something that is technical difficult, the first way that I would try to use is okay, think about something else that would be very common for you. You know, so it, even in visualization, even you know, creating a context that is more uh, that that. Uh, uses concepts and ideas that are more common to the to the person that you're that you're talking to is uh, is also good uh, a good mechanism. Um, again, I think you know the the key sentence of uh, uh, you know a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, I think we've uh, you know we've been there mm -hmm. numer numerous times, right? Yeah, and you know, related to that, uh, again, questions are coming in. I'm just being cognizant of the time. We'll we'll stop at the sure. top of the hour, and and if we can follow up with some of the individuals who've asked asked questions, we certainly will will make that attempt. Uh, just related to that, though, uh, you know, there's a certain age-related bias to visual information. You know, think of the elderly, and and you can complicate that with technology as well. You know, whether or not elderly are, are familiar or as comfortable with technology as perhaps they're the younger cohorts, and then. The flip side of that, you know, making uh, information uh, accessible to younger audience. What are you, what are your thoughts on that? It's two two answers probably. One is uh, um, back to that idea that uh, the choice of the channel of obviously takes into consideration um, the the type of audience that you're talking to. So that's why it's important that strategically you develop those assets. Uh, in a way that they can be ready for multiple outputs, and you know, printing things is not uh, is you know, will still be there for uh, for a lot of time for sure. Uh, the other uh, the other thing is that a number of digital uh, tools, you know, think of a tablet uh, or you know, even you know, the the reason for going for a kiosk was that it would be a touch screen, and uh, you know, touching things is a natural uh, gesture that we make. So um, the idea that the interface is simple to uh, make the user, to invite the user in exploring that content is a key uh, design uh, paradigm that we use every time. It's not only the content that needs to be simple, but it's also the exploration of that content that has to be you know, natural and intuitive so that, you know, uh, age effects or or uh, the fact that you're not familiar with uh you don't need to know how a you know uh, how, how a touch screen works you you touch the screen right so um i think you, you can also leverage specific digital tools that are more prone to you know just being there and you just the, the use of uh Touch screens, I think, was was probably one of the one of the best thing that uh, one of the best uh, business idea that Steve Jobs had when uh, when he launched the iPhone one. Ah, uh, Steve Jobs. Maybe just a couple of quick questions here uh, as we're getting closer to the top of the hour. Uh, what approximate level of effort in terms of schedule and cost to develop a web portal such as the one that you demonstrated today? Just order of magnitude. So, in terms of timing, uh, I think those are. You know, the, the, the couple of examples that we showed you uh, were in, in the order of uh, you know, two to three months of uh, effort. So another uh, element that I would bring here is that uh, our design process is that uh, so one of the examples that I show you is actually not uh, a website, it is a dynamic presentation of a website. Uh, so it's called a graphic mock-up. Uh, so it, it, it allows us to have this uh, cycle of design that is very fast and it allows you to check 
um, if all the design stands before you, st you start to develop. You know, so it's, it, the concept is called uh, fast prototyping. And, and so it, it's more cost effective. Uh, you build just what you need and you validate uh, the design before you actually build the tool. Maybe since we're now at 10 o'clock, we'll take one more question and uh, then we'll, we'll follow up with the folks that have submitted questions here online and, and make sure that you get an answer. Um, sure. Question is, uh, so ideally we'd visualize everything about a project. However, which type of information do you think is most important to display visually, i.e. project description, schedule efforts uh, to engage? What do you think in terms of the priority is, is the most applicable and important for the process that you've outlined? I don't, I don't think there's a single uh, answer for, uh, for every project. Uh, the, that's what the, that strategy uh, step at the beginning is all about. And you know, it's, it's not rocket science, it doesn't take, uh, it doesn't take weeks, but it's, it's the, that key moment where you look at the project from all of these uh, facets and you pick the ones uh, where you need to put the effort and where uh, you need to focus because you have specific objectives or because you know that there are specific concerns or because um, some of those elements are more critical to the success of the project, to the permitting, uh, of that project uh, and, and, and so forth. So looking at all these angles at the beginning is really, you know, the the key aspect of, uh, of that workflow, I believe. Okay, great. That's all we have time for. Um, this has been a great presentation. Thank you, Massimo, for your time and, and preparing this. And, and I know it's getting uh, late in the day there for you, so you must be getting hungry. Uh, Thank you everyone for joining us today. We certainly appreciate your time and, uh, and your attention. If you have any follow-up questions, uh, our contact information is there on the screen. Feel free to reach out to me, kseal at golder.com. Uh, and we've co uh, collected your questions here today and I'll see if there's a way that we can follow up directly with you as well on that. Be safe, please take care of yourselves and your loved ones and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much, have a great day. Thank you very much.